Yo, 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 yo. It's good, Joe. I'm going to go ahead and do another chapter. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, this chapter is only six pages. We're going to bring Twitter on to, uh, into the studios. I was recording on Facebook on my phone last time. I'm drinking this. I'm drinking this beer, right? Raspberry Cheesecake IPA. They have like these cheesecake IPAs. This is the second one I've had in like a week or something like that. I don't know. It's a little bit goofy, in my opinion. It's all right. So yeah, Twitter folks, we're about to record uh, some Angela Davis's Women Race in Class. Oh, I forgot that y'all can't hear me on YouTube unless I'm in here. Uh, Women Race in Class by Angela Davis, Chapter 6. Uh, we just recorded Chapter 5, and if folks don't know, I'm releasing this on my YouTube. Please subscribe there if you're not. Also going to be putting it out on my podcast channels, which you can find on Spotify and uh, Apple Podcasts, as well as my website, Stitcher, and a couple of other places. So definitely, definitely subscribe to those. Give me the reviews on the Apple Podcasts, all that. So, you know, let's get right into it. Women Race in Class by Angela Davis. Chapter 6, Education and Liberation, Black Women's Perspective. Millions of black people, and especially the women, were convinced that emancipation was the coming of the Lord. This was the fulfillment of prophecy and legend. It was the golden dawn after chains of a thousand years. It was everything miraculous and perfect and promising. There was joy in the South. It rose like perfume, like a prayer. Men stood quivering. Slim, dark girls, wild and beautiful with wrinkled hair, wept silently. Young women, black, tawny, white, and golden, lifted shivering hands. And old and broken mothers, black and gray, raised great voices and shouted to God across the fields and up to the rocks and the mountains. A great song arose, the loveliest thing born this side of the seas. It was a new song, and its deep and plaintive beauty, its great cadences and wild appeal, wailed, throbbed, and thundered on the world's ears with a message seldom voiced by man. It swelled and blossomed like incense, improvised and born anew out of an age long past in weaving into its texture the old and new melodies in word and in thought. Black people were hardly celebrating the abstract principles of freedom when they hailed the advent of emancipation. As that great human sob shrieked in the wind and tossed its tears upon the sea, free, free, free. Black people were not given vent to religious frenzy. They knew exactly what they wanted. The women and the men alike wanted land. They wanted the ballot, and they were consumed with desire for schools. Like the young slave child Frederick Douglass, many of the four million people who celebrated emancipation had long since realized that knowledge unfits a child to be a slave. And like Douglass's master, the former slaveholders realized that if you give an N-word an inch, he will take an L. Learning will spoil the best N-word in the world. Master Hugh's proscription notwithstanding, Frederick Douglass secretly continued his pursuit of knowledge. Soon he could write all the words from Webster's spelling book, further perfecting his skill by examining the family Bible and other books in the clandestiny of the night. Of course, Frederick Douglass was an exceptional human being who became a brilliant thinker, writer, and orator but his desire for knowledge was by no means exceptional among black people, who had always manifested a deep-seated urge to acquire knowledge. Great numbers of slaves also wanted to be unfit for the harrowing existence they led. 
a former slave interview during the 1930s, Jenny Proctor recalled the Webster spelling book, which she and her friends had surreptitiously studied. None of us was low to see a book or try to learn. They say we get smarter than they was if we learn anything. But we slips around and gets hold of that Webster's old blue back speller, and we hides it till way in the night, and then we lights a little pine torch and studies that spelling book. We learn it, too. I can read some now and write a little, too. Black people learned that emancipation's forty acres and a mule was a malicious rumor. They would have to fight for land. They would have to fight for political power. And after centuries of educational deprivation, they would zealously assert their right to satisfy their profound craving for learning. Thus, like their sisters and brothers all over the South, the newly liberated black people of Memphis assembled and resolved that education was their first priority. On the first anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, they urged the northern teachers to make haste and to bring their tents with them, ready for erection in the field, by the roadside, or in the fort, and not to wait for magnificent houses to be erected in time of war. The mystifying powers of racism often emanate from its irrational, topsy-turvy logic. According to the prevailing ideology, black people were allegedly incapable of intellectual advancement. After all, they had been chattel, naturally inferior as compared to the white epitomes of humankind. But if they really were biologically inferior, they would have manifested neither des desire. I have to make an edit. <laughs> The desire, here we go. The desire, nor the capability to acquire knowledge. Ergo, no prohibition of learning would have been necessary. In reality, of course, black people had always exhibited furious impatience as regards the acquisition of education. The yearning for knowledge had always been there. As early as 1787, black people petitioned the state of Massachusetts for the right to attend Boston's free schools. After the petition was rejected, Prince Hall, who was the leader of this initiative, established a school in his own home. Perhaps the most stunning illustration of this early demand for education was the work of an African-born woman who was a former slave. In 1793, Lucy Terry Prince boldly demanded an audience before the trustees of the newly established Williams College for Men, who had refused to admit her son into the school. Unfortunately, the racist prejudices were so strong that Lucy Prince's logic and eloquence could not sway the trustees of this Vermont institution yet she aggressively defended her people's desire for, and right to, education. Two years later, Lucy Terry Prince successfully defended a land claim before the highest court of the land, and according to surviving records, she remains the first woman to have addressed the Supreme Court of the United States. 1793 was also the year an ex-slave woman who had purchased her freedom established a school in the city of New York, which was known as Katie Ferguson's School for the Poor. Her pupils, whom she recruited from the poorhouse, were both black and white, 28 and 20 respectively, and were quite possibly both boys and girls. Forty years later, the young white teacher, Prudence Crandall, steadfastly defended black girls' rights to attend her Canterbury, Connecticut school. Crandall persistently taught her black pupils until she was dragged off to jail for refusing to shut down her school. Margaret Douglas was another white woman who was imprisoned in Norfolk, Virginia, for operating a school for black children. The most outstanding examples of white women's sisterly solidarity with black women are associated with black people's historical struggles for education.
Like Prudence Crandall and Margaret Douglas, Myrtilla Minor literally risked her life as she sought to impart knowledge to young black women. In 1851, when she initiated her project to establish a black teacher's college in Washington, D.C., she had already instructed black children in Mississippi, a state where education for blacks was a criminal offense. After Myrtilla Minor's death, Frederick Douglass described his own incredulousness when she first announced her plans to him. During their first meeting, he wondered about her seriousness in the beginning, but then he realized that the fire of enthusiasm lighted in her eye and that the true martyr spirit flamed in her soul. My feelings were those of mingled joy and sadness. Here, I thought, is another enterprise, wild, dangerous, desperate, and impracticable, and destined only to bring failure and suffering. Yet I was deeply moved with admiration by the heroic purpose of the delicate and fragile person who stood, or rather moved, to and fro before me. It was not long before Douglas recognized that none of the warnings he issued to her, and not even the stories of the attacks on Prudence Crandall and Margaret Douglas, could shake her determination to found a college for black women teachers. To me, the proposition was reckless almost to the point of madness. In my fancy, I saw this fragile little woman harassed by the law, insulted in the street, a victim of slave-holding malice and possibly beaten down by the mob. In Frederick Douglass's opinion, relatively few white people outside the anti-slavery activists would sympathize with Myrtilla Minor's cause and support her against the mob. This was a period, he argued, of diminishing solidarity with black people. Moreover, the District of Columbia was the very citadel of slavery, the place most watched and guarded by the slave power and where humane tendencies were more speedily detected and sternly opposed. In retrospect, however, Douglas confessed that he did not really understand the depth of this white woman's individual courage. Despite the grave risks, Myrtilla Minor opened her school in the fall of 1851, and within a few months, her initial six students had grown to 40. She taught her black students passionately over the next eight years, simultaneously raising money and urging congressmen to support her efforts. She even acted as a mother to the orphan girls whom she brought into her home so that they might attend the school. As Myrtilla Minor struggled to teach and as her pupils struggled to learn, they all fought evictions, arson attempts, and the other misdeeds of racist stone-throwing mobs. They were supported by the young women's families and abolitionists such as Harriet Beecher Stowe, who donated a portion of the royalties she received from the sale of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Myrtilla Minor may have been frail, as Frederick Douglass observed, but she was definitely formidable and was always able, at lesson time, to discover the eye of that racist storm. Early one morning, however, she was abruptly awakened by the odor of smoke and raging flames, which soon consumed her schoolhouse. Although her school was destroyed, the inspiration she provided lived on and eventually Miner's Teachers College became a part of the District of Columbia's public educational system. I never passed the Miner Normal School for Colored Girls, so Frederick Douglass confessed in 1883, without a feeling of self-reproach that I could have ought to quench the zeal, shake the faith, and quail the courage of the noble woman by whom it was founded and whose name it bears. Sisterhood between black and white women was indeed possible, and as long as it stood on a firm foundation, as with this remarkable woman and her friends and students, it could give birth to earth-shaking accomplishments. Myrtilla Minor kept the candle burning that others before her, like the Grimke sisters and Prudence Crandall, had left as a powerful legacy.
It could not have been a mere historical coincidence that so many of the white women who defended their black sisters in the most dangerous of situations were involved in the struggle for education. They must have understood how urgently black women needed to acquire knowledge, a lamp unto their people's feet and a light unto the path toward freedom. Black people who did receive academic instruction inevitably associated their knowledge with their people's collective battle for freedom. As the first year of black schooling in Cincinnati drew to a close, pupils who were asked, what do you think most about, furnished these answers. First, we are going to be good boys and when we get a man to get the poor slaves from bondage. And I am sorrow to hear that the boat of Tiskilwa went down with two hundred poor slaves. It grieves my heart so that I could faint in one minute, seven years old. Second, what we are studying for is to try to get the yoke of slavery broke and the chains parted asunder and slaveholding cease forever, twelve-year-old. Third, bless the cause of abolition. My mother and stepfather, my sister and myself, were all born in slavery. The Lord did let the oppressed go free. Roll on the happy period that all nations shall know the Lord. We thank him for his many blessings. Eleven-year-old. Fourth, this is to inform you that I have two cousins in slavery who are entitled to their freedom. They have done everything that the will requires, and now they won't let them go. They talk of selling them down the river. If this was your case, what would you do, ten-year-old? The last surviving answer came from a sixteen-year-old attending this new Cincinnati school. It is an extremely fascinating example of the way the students gleaned a contemporary meaning from world history that was as close to home as the desire to be free. Fifth, let us look back and see the state in which the Britons and Saxons and Germans lived. They had no learning and had not a knowledge of letters. But not look, some of them are our first men. Look at King Alfred and see what a great man he was. He at one time did not know his ABC, but before his death he commanded armies and nations. He was never discouraged, but always looked forward and studied the harder. I think the colored people study like King Alfred, they will soon do away the evil of slavery. I can't see how the Americans can call this a land of freedom where so much slavery is. As far as black people's faith and knowledge was concerned, this 16-year-old child said it all. This unquenchable thirst for knowledge was as powerful among the slaves in the South as among their free sisters and brothers in the North. Needless to say, the anti-literacy restrictions of the slave states were far more rigid than in the North. After the Nat Turner Revolt in 1831, legislation prohibiting the education of slaves was strengthened throughout the South. In the words of one slave code, teaching slaves to read and write tends to dissatisfaction in their minds and to produce insurrection and rebellion. With the exception of Maryland and Kentucky, every southern state absolutely prohibited the education of slaves. Throughout the South, slaveholders resorted to the lash and the whipping post in order to counter their slaves' irrepressible will to learn. Black people wanted to be educated. The poignancy of the slaves' struggles for learning appeared everywhere. Frederica Bremer found a young woman desperately trying to read the Bible. Oh, this book, she cried out to Miss Bremer. I turn and turn over its leaves, and I wish I understood what is on them. I try and try. I should be so happy if I could read, but I cannot. Susie King Taylor was a nurse and teacher in the first black regiment of the Civil War. In her autobiography, she described her persistent efforts to educate herself during slavery. White children, sympathetic adults, as well as her grandmother, assisted her to acquire the skills of reading and writing. 
Like Susie King's grandmother, numerous slave women ran great risks as they imparted to their sisters and brothers the academic skills they had secretly procured. Even when they were compelled to convene their schools during the late hours of the night, women who had managed to acquire some knowledge attempted to share it with their people. These were some of the early signs, in the North and South alike, of that post-emancipation phenomenon which Du Bois called a frenzy for schools. Another historian described the ex-slaves' thirst for learning these words. With a yearning born of centuries of denial, ex-slaves worshipped the sight and sound of the printed word. Old men and women on the edge of the grave could be seen in the dark of the night, poring over the scripture by the light of a pine knot, painfully spelling out the sacred words. According to yet another historian, many educators reported that they found a keener desire to learn among the Negro children of the Reconstruction South than among white children in the North. About half of the volunteer teachers who joined the massive education campaign organized by the Freedmen's Bureau were women. Northern white women went south during Reconstruction to assist their black sisters, who were absolutely determined to wipe out illiteracy among the millions of former slaves. The dimensions of this task were Herculean. According to Du Bois, the prevailing illiteracy rate was 95%. In the histories chronicling the Reconstruction era, and in the historical accounts of the women's rights movement, the experiences of black and white women working together in the struggle for education have received sparse attention. Judging, however, from the articles in the Freed Man's Record, these teachers were undoubtedly inspired each other and were themselves inspired by their students. Oh, excuse me. Just a couple more paragraphs left, by the way. I do not like the raspberry cheesecake IPA. Maybe I'll get used to it. Almost universally mentioned in the white teacher's observations was the former slave's unyielding commitment to knowledge. In the words of a teacher working in Raleigh, North Carolina, no, I said North Carolina. Yeah, did it. In the words of a teacher working in Raleigh, North Carolina, it is surprising to me to see the amount of suffering which many of the people endure for the sake of sending their children to school. Material comfort was unhesitatingly sacrificed for the furtherance of educational progress. A pile of books is seen in almost every cabin, though there be no furniture except a poor bed a table, and two or three broken chairs. As teachers, the black and white women seem to have developed a profound and intense mutual appreciation. A white woman working in Virginia, for example, was immensely impressed by the work of a black woman teacher who had just emerged from slavery. It seems almost a miracle, this white woman exclaimed, that a colored woman who had been a slave up to the time of the surrender would succeed in a vocation to her so novel. In the reports she authored, the black woman in question expressed sincere by... by, by, by though by no means servile, gratitude for the work of her friends from the North. By the time of the Hayes betrayal and the overthrow of radical reconstruction, the accomplishments in education had become one of the most powerful proofs of progress during the potentially revolutionary era.
Fisk University, Hampton Institute, and several other black colleges and universities had been established in the post-Civil War South. Some 247, 333 pupils were attending 4,329 schools, and these were the building blocks for the South's first public school system, which would benefit black and white children alike. Although the post-Reconstruction period and the attendant rise of Jim Crow education drastically diminished black people's educational opportunities, the impact of the Reconstruction experience could not be entirely obliterated. The dream of land was shattered for the time being, and the hope for political equality waned. But the beacon of knowledge was not easily extinguished, and this was the guarantee that the fight for land and for political power would unrelentingly go on. Had it not been for the Negro school and college, the Negro would, to all intents and purposes, have been driven back to slavery. His Reconstruction leadership had come from Negroes educated in the North and white politicians, capitalists, and philanthropic teachers. The counter-revolution of 1876 drove most of these, save the teachers, away. But already, through establishing public schools and private colleges, and by organizing the Negro Church, the Negro had acquired enough leadership and a knowledge. and knowledge to thwart the worst designs of the new slave drivers. Aided by their white sister allies, black women played an indispensable role in creating this new fortress. The history of women's struggle for education in the United States reached a true peak when black and white women together led the post-Civil War battle against illiteracy in the South. Their unity and solidarity preserved and confirmed one of our history's most fruitful promises. Bam. That's chapter six. Thanks again for tuning in, y'all. Don't forget to subscribe, like, comment, tell me what books you want to hear. Tell me something you didn't like, something that you did like, something you learned in this podcast, uh, in this chapter. All right, y'all. Peace out and have a great Monday night. Well, it's Tuesday morning. Okay. Peace.